Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for June 25th, 2018. On today's episode, we'll talk about what we've been up to at the water cooler. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Shredda, and joining me on today's podcast is Slash Film Weekend Editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. And writers Y Trend Bowie. Hey, everyone. And Chris Evangelista. Hello. Okay, guys. Uh, I hope you guys had a fun weekend. I I was very busy. Let's let's just get into it. Uh, uh, on Saturday, I uh, went to Disneyland for the first time in in many months. Uh, Pixar Pier opened up at Disney California Adventure, and this is basically the Pixar retheme of Paradise Pier, which was kind of like their like uh, nod back to the old like. California beachside uh, amusement parks of of days past, um, and uh, basically what happened was instead of building a Pixar area, you know, an immersive land where you get sucked into the worlds of Pixar, they basically transformed this old uh, land, including. Um, one of the best roller coasters in the park, uh, California Screaming, has been rethemed the Incredicoaster. Um, and I, I think I've been telling people that I, I'm comparing this kind of to Solo, a, heart, a, a, a Star Wars story in many ways. It, it's not the Pixar land we wanted. Uh, it's not the one that, that uh, people uh, were excited about, but it was the best case scenario for it, if that makes any sense. Um, California Screaming was always a great uh, roller coaster, as I mentioned, and now it, it never had a theme to it. Now it has a theme of like uh, Edna is babysitting Jack Jack, and uh, Jack Jack gets free, and basically you are, I guess you are Dash because you're moving really fast, and you're trying to catch Jack Jack. It's a it, it's a lot of fun. Um, the, the Pixar area is is still kind of under construction. A lot of it isn't open yet, but there's a lot of good new food. Uh, as a Disneyland annual pass holder, we're all about the food at Disneyland. They had um, the Abominable Snowman has, is selling uh, his ice cream, which is uh, you know yellow ice cream. I'm not sure why it's yellow, but it's yellow. Uh, it is uh, lemon flavored with a raspberry uh, slushy underneath it. It is delicious. Some people are saying it's better than the Dole Whip. Those people are nuts. Uh, but it is good. It's very good. And we ate at um, the Lamplight Lounge, which is the retheme of Ariel's Grotto and the Cove Bar was turned into this Pixar eatery. Um uh, the prices were increased, the food portions were decreased, but I am here to tell you that uh, everything I had there was delicious. Uh, the, the, the the best things I had were the piggy wings and the uh, potato skins, which like actually almost tasted more like uh, hash browns than potato skins. Um, but this eatery is really cool, guys, because it's um, it's almost like a, if TGI Fridays made a Pixar restaurant... So the, the walls are filled with Pixar memorabilia and all, you know, I have all those art of Pixar books. I, I love those things. And like, it, it's basically like, you know, someone took those and, uh, you know, uh, swallowed them and then threw them up all over the place. Actually, that sounds bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but y you know what I mean? Uh, and, and th there's all just sorts of little details like, um, like, you know, in a restaurant, you have those two doors where the people from the kitchen staff go in and out of and instead of saying in and out it, it says inside and outside uh, in, inside out um which is clever uh, things like that they have a uh we didn't get to eat in there but they actually because pixar at pixar headquarters they have like all these like secret rooms and stuff so they decided to give this restaurant a secret room called the office and you actually have to go like in this backstage area and there's this door it's like this industrial door that has like this crank and you got to crank it and then as you crank it uh there's a series of three light bulbs above it and you got to make all three light bulbs light up and then a green siren above it goes off and that's when you can like actually open the door like you can't open it uh, without doing that, which I'm sure the kitchen staff and the wait staff will will get really annoyed at. But um, I don't know. It was really cool. I would I would highly recommend eating there and checking out Pixar Pier. It was it was insanely busy. And oh, I also did go to Disneyland to see the the uh, the fairly new Pixar fireworks for Pixar Fest. I, I guess they've been going on for a couple months now, um, and uh, this was a blast because they basically just you know. Uh, 
projected scenes from Pixar movies onto the castle while fireworks like you know went off and uh, the up house flo- floats by uh, Buzz Lightyear you know flies through the air it, it, it's 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 a lot of fun uh, I have renewed my annual pass so I will be back for sure and um, that was what I did on Saturday and I did a, that was like a whole day at the parks it was I'm not used to doing that these days um, on Sunday I had I headed down to um, Pasadena to cover the Ant-Man and the Wasp Junket. I talked to uh, Marvel Studios head Kevin Feige and director Peyton Reed. Uh, Both of those interviews will hit the site this week, so I will not spoil them. but, uh, But both are good. Catch those when we get to them. And apparently I've been the only one actually doing stuff this weekend. Everybody's been at their uh, their TVs watching stuff. So let's get to uh, what we've been watching. Uh, let's start off with uh, HT. What have you been watching? So uh, I recently got to see First Reformed, uh, which stars Ethan Hawke and was directed by and written by Paul Schrader, who wrote um, Taxi Driver and other Scorsese films. And it's very much a sort of modern response to Taxi Driver. I think actually towards the end, one of the monologues that Ethan Hawke um, rails off, rolls off is sounds very similar to a Taxi Driver monologue, so much that I, I'm pretty sure that Paul Schrader probably just like reused one of his toss Taxi Driver monologues and put it in this film. But it's a it's a really great, really impactful movie that I wasn't sure what to make of it for a long time after I watched it. But it's, I think it's a movie that really stayed with me and is really um, sort of unsettling and beautiful and a little bit very meditative, much more so than like the tax driver was, but it definitely basically brings a sort of religious twist on that, um, struggle with helplessness and frustration that you see in the original Taxi Driver, but has more of a sort of wider scope in a sense. It's both it's both more personal and intimate and a bit wider. I kind of got shades also of, of Mother as well with the sort of climate change themes that happen in it. But it's a really great, uh, really interesting film that um, – definitely will will stay with me for a while and ethan hawk is just is so good in it he's he's just had one of like my favorite second acts in hollywood careers ever i think and where can we see this movie uh that's a good question um well i saw it in theaters but it's about it's been in theaters for about a month now and so it's still in theaters it's still in theaters. I saw it at the Landmark Theater near me, um, but it's it might actually go out of theaters soon. But uh, it's really good. It's a, it's a great A24 film. And uh, so at some point, you'll probably see it on Amazon Prime because A24 has that deal with Amazon. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's move on to Chris. Chris, you've been watching a lot of stuff. Uh, what have you been watching? Oh, yeah. So I went and saw Hereditary again because my wife wanted to see it. And I had previously seen it by myself at a press screening. So uh, I went and saw that with her. And it's just as good as I remember it being. I uh, I continue to think it's it's definitely one of the the better horror movies of the last few years. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's not much else to say, but, you know, I, I still love it. And uh uh, I we specifically waited a few weeks because I wanted there to be as few people in the theater as possible, and thankfully there were only like three other people, and that was perfect because I don't want to hear anyone Wait, talk. I, I have a question for you. We, we we all know your stance on the theatrical experience. You you do not like uh, you know seeing movies with large groups of crowds. Uh, yes. Is, what about your wife? Does your wife have somewhere? feeling she's she's indifferent she's better able to tune people out i'm very bad at tuning people out and that's part of my problem so you know things that bother me will not bother her like there's been times where we walk out of a movie and i'll be like did you hear that freaking asshole near us talking and she'll be like no i didn't hear it. so <laughs> i don't know maybe i'm maybe i'm just delusional and hearing things that aren't actually there but she's she's a, a little more tolerant of noise than i am and that was the only thing you saw in theaters this weekend. No, I saw Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom um, to because I, I, I wrote the spoiler review, which is up on SlashFilm.com right now. 
Uh, I was originally supposed to go to a, a press screening of this, but the press screening, the theater was over an hour away, and I did not want to drive that far for this movie. And seeing this at a closer theater near this weekend, I'm extra glad I did not go that, that far for this film because I really did not So, so instead, you contributed money to the, the overall box office. Yeah, so I guess, you know... <laughs> I guess Jurassic World wins in the end, but uh, you know I, I encourage everyone to go read my review to to see my to to read my full thoughts on the film. But I really did not like this film. Um, in some ways, it's a can, lot can, better. Yeah, can, Sorry. can, can you talk uh, briefly in a non-spoiler way of why you didn't like the film? Right. So as I said in the review, um, this film it's somehow both better and worse than Jurassic World. So uh, it's better because um, J. A. Bayona who directed it is a much better filmmaker than Colin Trevorrow. He, you know, he is really good at, you know, establishing mood and there's some amazing shots in this film. So on that front, it's, it's better, but it still has the same script problems because uh, Colin Trevorrow and Derek Connolly, who wrote the, the previous film, wrote this film too. And uh, I've said this before, but I don't hate Jurassic world. Like a lot of people do. I thought it was entertaining. And what I liked about Jurassic world even though I don't think it's a, a good movie, quote unquote, what I liked about it was that film was like a dumb monster movie and it didn't seem like it was trying to be anything else. It was like embracing its its B-movie attitude. This film, in contrast, it thinks it's smarter than it actually is and that really got on my nerves. Like the first film, not the first one, the previous film didn't have any pretensions and this film, you can tell that when they were writing it, they they were really like proud of themselves because they thought they were doing something cool, and I just I just wasn't buying it. And uh, again, this is stuff I say in my review, but I really feel like Colin Trevorrow hates this franchise, and it's really weird that he's been put in charge of it. Especially when like you know I I recently rewatched the first Jurassic Park, and. Man, that film, you know, the film holds up so well, even still, you know, after all these years. And what's clear in that film is, you know, Spielberg, he loves the dinosaurs, even the scary dinosaurs. He really loves these these creatures. He, You know, he has this affinity, he has this affection for these, these creatures as if they're actual characters. And I don't get that from Colin Trevorrow's script. He, you know, they're just props for him. And that really bothers me. And... There's this, uh, you know, without getting away spoilers, there's this one scene that involves uh, a Brachiosaurus, and it just pissed me off, man, because it's just, it's just needlessly cruel, and it did not need to be in this film. And uh, you know, if I weren't reviewing the movie, I might have just gotten up and walked out during the scene. It occurs like at the midway point. So, yeah, those are <laughs> those are a summation of my thoughts. I am not a fan of Jurassic World: Fallen Kingdom. You know, I did this interview with Colin, which we'll publish on the site, uh, I think, tomorrow. But even in this interview, he admits that he doesn't think that there should have ever been... You know, I don't want to take his words out of context. I don't have them in front of me. But I think he said that he doesn't think that there should ever have been any sequels to Jurassic Park. And, he's right. <laughs> and uh, and I think he even says he's, he's stupid for wanting to make them. But he, you know, but... Uh, I also, I just want to say, say that, you know, I know Colin Trevorrow gets a lot of shit online and he said some dumb things in the past, but I do think he gets beaten up a little bit too much. Like, I don't think he's a bad person. Like, I, I know, like, film Twitter really has it out for him. And I, you know, I think he he means well. And I actually really like his first film, uh, Safety Not Guaranteed. But he I, he's just really wrong for this franchise. And I, it really bugs me that he's still going to be involved with it. You know, it is interesting. I don't want to put this on the same level as Star Wars Last Jedi, but I feel like in many ways uh, this film is doing for that franchise what Star Wars Last Jedi was in, in taking it in a completely new direction. Um, and it's interesting how kind of critics have, uh, you know, gone with Ryan Johnson, but they uh, are unwilling to go with uh, Colin Trevorrow in the direction he's going with this film. Yeah, I agree. But, I actually say that in the review, but what I yeah. say is that uh, as different as The Last Jedi is, it feels very much in the spirit of Star Wars. I know people, plenty of people will disagree with that, but I personally think The Last Jedi feels like its heart is firmly within you know the Star Wars mythos. And Ryan Johnson clearly is someone who loves 
the Star Wars mythology and, you know, wants to do something new with it. And I just don't get that from these Jurassic World films. But I know plenty yeah. of people disagree. You know, let me skip uh, from you to Brad for a second. Brad, you also saw this movie over the weekend. Uh, did you have different feelings than Chris? Um, I mean, I don't think that I have as much disdain for it that Chris does. I definitely walked away um, a little more satisfied than I thought I would based on some of the early reactions. I thought this was just going to be kind of a crazy movie that didn't really feel much like a Jurassic Park film, and I was just going to be completely dissatisfied, but... There's enough here brought to the table by uh, J.A. Bayona as far as his style is concerned and creating suspense and uh, dread and some pretty impressive sequences involving the dinosaurs that I was still pretty well entertained. I, I, I don't think it's a great movie by any means, um, but I also agree with Chris that there are parts of it that make it better than Jurassic World because, you know, the comparisons to Star Wars are interesting because Jurassic World is in many ways The Force Awakens of the Jurassic Park franchise revival. It relied a, a lot on nostalgia. It basically recreated the plot of the original movie. Uh, had a lot of winks and nods to the to Jurassic Park um, while trying to do, you know, new things, introduce, you know, the Indominus Rex, new characters, all that jazz. And Fallen Kingdom does the similar Last Jedi thing by trying to get rid of the past in a way that allows them to move forward and turn the franchise into something else that isn't just you know, things going wrong at a theme park and, you know, tracking down dinosaurs and, and running from them when things go wrong. But at the same time, it is it seems like it does it in a very clumsy way that is not very satisfying. And there are threads that are meant to be shocking and interesting, but are really just perplexing. And I, I, are, there's no indication as to, like, what kind of ramifications they'll have in the future. Um, one particular reveal towards the end of the movie is you don't get into any. Yeah, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to say what it is, but it's 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 shocking on one level. But then when you think about it, you're like, well, who cares and and why? Like, what 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 is this going to do? Um, and then the setup, of course, for the third movie is the craziest thing because I have no idea what a Jurassic World three looks like after the end of this movie. <laughs> um, so it's just the the it's almost like kind of I feel the same kind of prospect as if they made an independence day three after the insanity that was independence day resurgence like i i kind of want to see what that movie looks like because i can't <laughs> imagine it because it's because it sounds so ludicrous to me yeah also in my colin trevorrow interview he kind of goes into that and explains the ending and uh kind of teases us what the third film would be uh but so look out for that uh tomorrow but uh back to you chris you also saw sharp objects uh, yeah, so Sharp Objects is the new HBO. Uh, I guess it's technically a mini series because it's it's you know it's it's going to be like a one and done thing. Um, it's adapted from the the Gillian Flynn novel, the same name she wrote uh, Gone Girl and a few other things. Uh, and it stars Amy Adams. And uh, you know I'll be writing a review eventually for the site, but it's really good. I I have like two episodes left before I finish it, but. Everything I've seen so far is, is fantastic. It's very dark. It's very twisted. And uh, Amy Adams, who I, I think is one of the best actresses working today, is phenomenal in it. So um, that arrives in July. I forget the exact date, but it's coming soon in July. So when that hits HBO, I, I highly recommend it. Very cool. Uh, on Friday night, I got to go and see Ant-Man and the Wasp on the Disney lot Um and uh, it, I was, you know, I, I want to admit here, I didn't have, I wasn't having the greatest expectations for this. You know, Ant Man uh, is a fun movie, but it's kind of disposable in my mind. It doesn't really have any larger uh, ramifications for the Marvel universe, and it, it kind of like, you know, if it came on, I'll watch it, but it's not something I'll ever seek out. And um, I arrived at the Walt Disney lot, and uh, you know, I, I see a lot of movies there. Um, and one thing that's never happened, but uh, before the movie, they had a reception with food and alcohol. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this is a bad sign uh, because, you know, uh, it just seemed like they were trying to, uh, you know, butter up the, the critics who were about to see it uh, before the junket. Uh, uh, but um, I'm happy to tell you that the movie is a lot of fun. I think it's... Uh, um, 
you know, I, I'm not as positive on it as uh, the critics that Brad did in his uh, roundup on the site. Uh, but even me, you know, I think this is a, a lot funnier than the first film. It's hilarious. Uh, it is very much a standalone story. So if you are expecting this film to connect in any meaningful way with Infinity War or Avengers 4, you know, I would damper your expectations. You know, this is very much its own, like, just uh, spinoff, uh, you, you know, its own story arc. Uh, and, um, you know, don't go in expecting to get any answers. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, Michael Pena, it, it was hilarious. He steals the show. Uh, the... You know, it seems like this time around, Peyton Reed had a lot more time to kind of like consider the miniature maxature kind of action sequences. And that is that is also a lot of fun. And uh, I'm not going to say the villain in this is is great, but it Marvel is on a roll with, um, you know, they, they were criticized for many years of having kind of like these uh, weak villains, these comic booky villains and uh I, I i think this alongside the last few uh have been villains that have motivations that we can relate to and uh empathize with and uh and that's great um yeah so i i really enjoyed ant man and the wasp i highly recommend you check it out uh when it hits theaters uh later this week i think no, uh, July 6th or july 6th um and uh while i was at home I've been watching some TV. I watched uh, BBC America's Killing Eve. Um, this is the series. Um, it's written by uh, Phoebe Waller. Uh, yeah, Phoebe Waller Bridge, uh, who played L3 in Solo, a Star Wars story. Uh, but don't expect anything like this. This is kind of like a drama show. It stars uh, Sandra O oh as this desk bound MI5 officer who. Um, begins to track down this um, assassin and uh, it's kind of about this obsession uh, that both of them have with each other because the assassin kind of realizes that someone's tracking her and um, it, it's just, I don't know, it's so hard to explain why this is good but it's but it's so good. I'm, uh, I think five episodes in, I think it's like eight episodes or something like that. It's, it's a pretty short uh, yeah, eight episodes. Uh, I would highly recommend it. It's it's an adaptation of a book, and uh, I think it's you know I'm watching it on demand. So if you have BBC America on whatever you uh, you know whatever TV service you have, I'm sure you have access to this. I would I would highly recommend you check it out. And um, last night I saw the season the two finale of Westworld, and it broke my brain. Um, now, I, I, I almost feel like – I was saying this on Twitter. I almost feel the way some people kind of like were fans of Lost and then they felt like hurt and um, uh, just like, you know, they, they kind of turned against Lost in, in the final seasons. I feel – I feel like that might be me with this show. I didn't really understand it with Lost. I loved Lost, but uh, I, I really just don't understand what they're going for. This this whole season has kind of been a mess. I'm not sure if it's, I'm not sure if I'm too dumb to understand what's going on or what. I don't know. The Nolan seems so smart, so I I almost want to like you know think that like maybe like I do I get the the the. The format of the season is, you know, Bernard is, you know, now functioning and there's, you know, he's seeing different times at different. I totally get that, but it was a totally confusing and frustrating way to experience the season. And, uh, you know, without getting into spoilers, but I think, uh, you know, some of the twists and turns that happened in this final episode uh, just seem ridiculous and things, you know. It doesn't seem like something I want. It's like a jumbled mess of ideas. I it almost reminded me of the Matrix sequels in 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 a way. Uh, Chris, I know you also are watching this for the site. Uh, how did you feel of the Westworld finale? I don't know. This whole this whole season has been very strange. I mean, uh, on one level, I appreciated how. Uh, you know, without getting into spoilers, this finale literally like blows up the show. Like the show as we know it 
there's no way it can still be the same show in season three based on what happens at the end of this episode. So on that level, I kind of appreciate how risky they're being and, you know, they're taking the show into a whole new direction because, you know, that premise of, you know, people trapped in a, you know, um, amusement park, you can only do so much with that as the Jurassic Park films show. You can only do the same, you know, so much of that before it becomes repetitive. So I appreciate that they're taking it in this new direction, but I, I don't know. I don't even know what the hell <laughs> the next season's going to be after this season. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. You know, part of what attracted me to this show was that whole kind of open world theme park environment and uh, whatever the next season's going to be, because we really don't know what the next season's going to be. Uh, it does not seem to be about that in any meaningful way. Um, and I just, I don't know, I just feel like this season they were trying to make things complicated, need- needlessly complicated, and the reveals were not even a- a rewarding. Like, I love mysteries i like twists i i absolutely adore theorizing you know do the water cooler between episodes i like solving puzzles and you know putting pieces together but i don't think any of those reasons or or any of those things are why westworld season two was bad for me i just feel like this fractured fractured narrative uh just i don't know and and there's so many problems but you know what i i like the filmmakers behind this i like the nolans i like the directors that they've hired i like the writers they get i like the actors i like uh you know the soundtrack of this i like there's so much about the show i like so i am probably going to give season three a chance but like i'm on the edge so i don't i don't know i, I know uh the rest of this uh, the people on this podcast have not yet watched the finale um so I, i'll say no more uh, but, uh, yeah, let's move on to, uh, Brad, what else have you been watching? Yes. Just like Chris, uh, I also saw Hereditary and it's extremely unsettling and creepy and there is an overwhelming sense of dread throughout the entire movie. It's definitely an A24 horror movie, a, a slow burn rather than your traditional jump scare studio horror movie, but I actually appreciate that more. It's it's much more about the the tone of doom and horror that's surrounding this family, and uh, yeah, there's definitely some gruesome, shocking moments, and the uh, the third act is quite quite horrifying. Um, so yeah, I would definitely recommend seeing it. Just don't go in expecting, you know, something where you're constantly jumping all the time because of a spike in the uh, musical score or you know, people popping up from around corners or anything like that. And you've also been watching some Netflix comedy specials? Uh, just one, actually. I took the time over the weekend to watch Steve Martin and Martin Short's comedy special, uh, which was recorded live while they were doing a sort of a variety show tour across the country. Uh, the Netflix special was recorded uh, in South Carolina, and it's I, I really loved it. It's um, It definitely has an old-school kind of entertainment vibe to it almost like the the kind of variety show they used to do on tv back in you know the 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 40s and 50s and it's it's just really fun uh, a lot of it comes from just the rapport that steve martin and martin short have and they're definitely hamming it up you know for for the audience and uh it's a lot of it is scripted you can tell but there are some great improvised moments where thing (laughs) maybe like a joke doesn't land as well as it should or you know martin short flubs a line and they try to repeat it, and they're like, "Well, probably should have done that." Um, and it's it's just there's it's just a lot of fun. Uh, to, um, they you know they they do this great bit where they're the exchanging what they call Hollywood compliments to each other, where they're basically just roasting each other uh, about their careers and their appearance and things like that. Uh, there's a fun bit where Martin Short basically is this Jiminy Glick uh, ventriloquist dummy that Steve Martin is pretending to control, and uh, there's just it's a lot of fun stuff. It's it's definitely. Um, more of a, a classic comedy feel, but I think because of that is why I really enjoyed it. And uh, every week on the water cooler, you're telling us what you've been eating. So, what what interesting uh, thing have you been eating this week? Uh, so, I picked up two new breakfast cereals recently. Um, they apparently came out with these Dippin' Dots themed cereals. Um, for those of you that don't know, Dippin' Dots is that ice cream that you would, would see at like 
county fairs and theme parks and it's, it's the ice cream of the future brad it is the ice cream of the future because in the future ice cream is best consumed in tiny little frozen pellets and so they, they've apparently turned this into cereal now so the cereal as you would guess are is little round cereal balls they basically look like kicks they have two flavors that they just came out with one is cookies and cream and the other one is banana split and unfortunately, they are both supremely disappointing. Um, they both... I never would have thought. <laughs> um, it's the... the, the ba- it's basically, they basically taste like bland flavored kicks. The cookies and cream one barely has any real flavor to it. Like, it might as well just have been kicks where some of the kicks are, you know, a whiter color and some of the kicks look like uh, faded Cocoa Puffs. And then the banana split one is a little bit more interesting. It has a fruity flavor to it for sure. And it has these little um, pieces in it that look like they're tiny Dippin' Dots chunked together. And they taste kind of like little tiny like candies, I guess. Not quite, not like marshmallows, but something kind of like that. But again, the flavor is very bland. Like there's, there's a slight fruit, you know, taste to it, but nothing that like I was really satisfied with. I just I was just kind of eating. I'm just like, hmm, this is just kind of just eating plain wheat balls. Well, that's disappointing. Um, it really is. <laughs> last week at the, at the water cooler, I was talking about how I got a pizza oven and was cooking my own pizzas. Uh, the first batch came out uh, fantastic. Uh, what I didn't tell you is later in that week, I tried it again and uh, apparently did not learn everything that I learned the first time because the... Well, first of all, this oven cooks pizzas at like 900 degrees. So when you're cooking a pizza, it takes like a minute and a half to cook the pizza. And what that means is you have to like turn the pizza because the flame's on one side. So you have to turn it so that the whole pizza gets equally cooked. And uh, I did some stuff. I, 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 I messed up, guys. And um, while I tried to turn the pizza, the pizza fell apart in the oven and then caught in fire. Uh, so it was a gigantic mess. Uh, so, uh, this weekend I finally cooked my third batch of co- of pizzas, learning my lessons from that last time. Uh, I needed more flour so it didn't stick to the bottom of the pizza oven and it came out fantastic. Um, but yeah, so th- those are my pizza making adventures. Let's move on to what we've been playing. HT, you've been playing a lot of, uh, a lot of video games. Yeah, so the Kingdom Hearts 3 trailer came out about two weeks ago, but I've just been steadily getting more excited for this game that will be out in like eight months. I've been waiting 12, 14 years for this. 14 years. Yes. I've been waiting a long time for this game. And uh, in the process, I've kind of been revisiting one of the spinoff games that I was lucky enough to own because most of the other spinoff games were on consoles that I did not own, uh, like the PSP or the PS4. But uh, I did get one game on the um, Nintendo DS back in uh, <laughs> high school, I think. And this was Kingdom Hearts 358 over two days. And this is a spinoff game that followed the character Roxas, who was introduced in Kingdom Hearts 2. And kind of was a sort of in-between cool, uh, a prequel in a sense of like what he was doing right before the events of Kingdom Hearts 2 happened. And uh, it's a very tragic story and uh, one that I thought I knew because I thought I'd played it all, but I realized I had not. So I was, I went back to it, and I realized why I'd stopped playing it. it. was It was because I was stuck on this huge boss fight that uh, ended up giving me like a hand cramp because it was really annoying to play. But I enjoyed revisiting that so much that I started rewatching a lot of uh, Kingdom Hearts clips and cutscenes from other this other spin-off games that I couldn't play. So like the way do, that I catch do, up with Do these the, like put the do they put them into like movie sized yes. like packages? Yes. Five hour movies, which I watched all of. Wow. <laughs> um yeah, you can tell what I was doing this weekend. So uh I remember because the plot has become increasingly convoluted. Um, but I still love it regardless. And the only way that you can really catch up if you haven't played these games is to watch these cutscenes um, in movie form on YouTube or to watch Let's Plays, which I did a little bit of when I was in college. And I rewatched one Let's Play of uh, Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. And the, the kind of sucky thing is, is that a, a lot of this plot is actually essential 
to what's leading up to Kingdom Hearts 3. So I kind of, I fear for people who are just diving in straight from Kingdom Hearts 2 to Kingdom Hearts 3 because it would be very confusing. And uh, I was already confused just watching the cutscenes because it was just like, it was too messy. But I still love it. I'm still very excited for the game. And um, yeah, I did spend a lot of hours just watching Kingdom Kingdom Hearts cutscenes this weekend. So I had a very fun summer weekend. See, I've never, like, I, you know, I've played video games, but I've never actually watched, like, cutscene packages. Does it make sense? Because you're taking out the gameplay in between the cutscenes. Like, does it... It does make sense. Yeah. Oh, well, a lot of these, the cutscene movies that I watched actually had some gameplay in between. They just okay. showed the boss battles. Um, but, yeah, those ones, they I think they were cut basically like, oh, these are for people who, like, did not able, were not able to play, play, um the game and thus uh, we'll show you everything so it's a lot it's, it's actually a lot of fun as much as as I say it with like this sort of self-deprecating way I like I like watching these cutscenes a lot just because it's a fun way to to build up my anticipation for Kingdom Hearts 3 and I love all the characters in in this game very cool uh last week Brad you were talking about Jurassic World Evolution the Jurassic World Pokemon Go game but it seems like Pokemon Go has uh got back your attention you've been playing a lot of that uh why Indeed, uh, Pokemon Go just had an update where they finally introduced trading so that people can swap Pokemon that they've caught. Uh, there's a whole new feature where you are allowed to add friends and uh, send gifts that you pick up from Pokestops uh, which, that you spin in order to get items like potions and Pokeballs and all that jazz. Um, so now you can like you get gifts from Pokestops, you send them to people, so they get like a little digital postcard from where you picked it up. Um, and it gives you more items, uh, Pokeballs, potions, and there's even these new eggs that you can only get as gifts from other people that hatch uh, different kinds of Pokemon uh, within the game that you won't find in the wild. Yeah, so yeah, it's been a um, a good way to kind of reinvigorate the game. That's they they do you know little events here and there where, um, to catch more uh, abundance of certain kinds of Pokemon at different times that get people out for those who haven't filled out their Pokedex yet. Uh, but this is like the first big, huge change they've had in a while, and something that people have wanted, you know, since the very beginning. But at the same time, the trading is uh, it takes time and like effort to put into it because you have to be like a certain at a certain level of friendship with a person in order to trade higher, um, stronger levels. Wait, wait. Of so h- how do you have levels of friendship? Like, what's my level of friendship with you, Brad? Uh, well, so like, w- since you don't play, we don't have friendship. <laughs> <laughs> but like you, you, you basically you. Um, there's like a kind of like a, a a life bar that you see where there's like four hearts and it like slowly fills out the hearts w- uh, depending on like if you've exchanged gifts with players, if you've done raid battles with players, um, you know, like like different things like that that you do as part of like the community. So if you do those things with people, your friendship level increases and it makes it uh, easier and it like um, and it isn't quite as difficult to initiate trades for certain kinds of Pokemon. It's, it's a little bit more complicated, I think, than people wanted, but uh, Niantic wanted to make sure that they didn't just turn it into a thing where people were just easily swapping Pokemon. They wanted to keep the idea alive, you know, that you have, still have to go out into the world to catch Pokemon yourself rather than just having somebody from across the world just send it to you as easy as they could send an email. Brad, I still consider you a friend, even though we're not friends on Pokemon Go. <laughs> I mean, I meant, I meant we're not friends in the game. I, just, I know. We're, I'm just... we're obviously friends in real life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that brings us to the end of today's Slash Film Daily. Brad, where can people more, find more of your work? Uh, on Twitter, at Ethan underscore Anderton. Of course, SlashFilm.com is where I'm throwing around a bunch of words about movies and TV. And I also have my podcast, Go Flix Yourself, on iTunes. You can go and check it out and rate it five stars and... All that jazz. Can, can people friend you on Pokemon Go, or do you not want that? Uh, yeah, actually, you can, I haven't posted my um, my my uh, trainer ID number to Twitter yet, but I was planning on doing that today. So I will post that to Twitter, and if anybody any Pokemon Go players out there want to add me, they can feel free to do that. Yes. Uh, HD, where can people find more of your work online? You can find me every day at SlashFilm.com, and I'm on Twitter at HTranBooey. Chris, if people wanted to find you, where can they find you? Uh, I'm I'm also at SlashFilm.com, and I'm on Twitter at C Evangelista 413 
I will link uh, Chris's spoiler review of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, which, you know, goes into all the spoiler reasons why he did not like the film. Uh, as, and uh, you can find that on SlashFilm.com and linked in the show notes. Uh, this podcast, Slash Film Daily, is published every weekday on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send your, your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to Peter at SlashFilm.com. And uh, please go rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends, spread the word. We'll see you tomorrow.